Good evening. Since we don't have slides, I can go off, uh, off my notes and uh, take, take the long way around. Um, although I am knowledgeable that we're running a little bit behind. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes and as the Lord leads. Since uh, we don't have slides, I'd ask you to be using your, your Bibles. Um, and as always, we're going to start in Ephesians 2. Because Romans is Paul's missionary letter looking to raise support from the church at Rome to take the gospel to Europe. And, and as he does that, he, he comes up with this great treatise that expands the gospel. But I think it's important that every time we look, we look at what the gospel is. And the reason I think it's important that we do that is because it's easy. And, and tonight's message is kind of a shocking message. If you don't look through Ephesians, uh, Romans 6 and come away with, whoa, you know, this is a bit out there. This is a bit extreme. You know, extreme sports, you know, we, we you know, this is extreme living. And if you and, and it could be easy to look at this message and say it's about how I do works that gets me to heaven. And so I always want to start with the basis of salvation is through faith by grace. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I'm just going to stop there in Ephesians 2 because I, I think that's sufficient. We'll, next time we come back, we'll finish the rest of that thought. But grace through faith, not works. So Hudson is not preaching salvation by works. We are talking about salvation by faith that leads us to walk in the works that God has prepared for us to walk in and to live in as believers. What Hudson does not say and what we are not preaching from the book of Romans is that you cannot have an experience of faith in Jesus Christ and continue to live in a way that otherwise is unchanged. I can't come to Christ and say, Lord, save me. Just don't change anything in my life because I'm kind of comfortable with where everything is and I don't want anything to have to change. If we come with that, we have not come at all. We've said, let's put a dash of God on my life, not God here is my life. And the gospel that Paul preaches in the book of Romans is one that should lead us through what we've been through in Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, that we are desperately wicked and sinful people. And because of that, God gave his son. And through grace, which brings praise to his name, we can be saved. But because we come, we are changed. So turn to Romans 6, and let's read what we're going to try to accomplish, uh, cover tonight. And uh, we'll go from there. 
starting at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask you as we look at your word tonight and at this passage and contemplate the need to be slaves to righteousness and to experience the victory that you want us to have over sin. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would direct our eyes to your word and to our hearts. Take away the deception and and evil that the world tries to influence us with and help us be influenced by the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray, our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Romans 5, 1 to 8, 39, we says, talks overall about the confidence of future glory provided by the gospel. And verses 1 to 14 of chapter 6, we said, talks about the future glory foreseen in freedom from sin by union with Christ. Verses 15 to 23, which we'll at least start tonight, maybe get through, is the hope of future glory frees us to be slaves of righteousness. Now, last week we uh, finished up verses 8 through 14, and we talked about the fact that faith in Christ leads to hope for our eternal future with love for God and our siblings in faith. One thing that we realize as we contemplate that faith, hope, and love is that we have a great Savior. But the problem with that is that Jesus, and this is a quote, not mine, Jesus cannot simply be liked. You either kill him or crown him in your life. And that's uh, from Pastor Tim Keller. You just can't simply add a little dash of God to your life, particularly Jesus Christ. If you understand the claims that Jesus are making, you either crown him as Lord as your life or you 
throw stones. You look to crucify him because you don't want to submit to the creator of the universe. Now, here in chapter 6, we have started a progression. If you think of verse 1, you remember back to verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we con- are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is by no means. The, the Greek phrase, may genetai, may it never come into existence. Um, the King James translate it, translates it, God forbid. Um, it, it's just, may it never be something that exists. A Christian sinning to receive more grace. How can we who died to sin still live in it? But, but look, the phrase is, continue in sin. And we can think, if we read real quickly, and if we don't go back and look at what we read in verse 1, we can think, when we re- read verse 15, that it's just a repetition of verse 1. That's why you have to get out your Bible and look at things and look carefully and take your time because otherwise these subtleties will just, you know, they'll, 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 they'll pass us by and we'll miss the change in tenor of what Paul is trying to say because Paul is a very nuanced writer. He's very in your face but he's also nuanced at the same time, and you can miss things if you don't sit and contemplate and meditate. What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Same answer. Verse 1, continue in sin. Verse 15, sin. Okay, and... and, and Verse 1, the the Greek there is to be habitually, to be in habit, to dwell, to abide in sin. So we're not supposed to abide in sin, and then verse 15 says we're not supposed to sin. Now, I am not here teaching sinless perfection. It's not in the Bible. We will be perfectly sinless when we die and are in heaven or the Lord comes back and we are in heaven. That's when we'll achieve sinless perfection. But the problem is we take sin lightly as Christians in the 21st century. Well, I can never be, you know, I can never really be sinless and, you know, therefore I don't have any obligation to try at all. I don't have any obligation to be involved in the fight for sin, fight against sin because, you know, I'm just going to get to heaven and then I won't have to worry about it. Last week we read First John uh, chapter three verses one to ten, and I'm not going to read the whole thing today, but if we look at um, second to get there this is a great passage i'm I'm, going to go back and start at verse four because i think this this paragraph um is, is just really important as we come to think about the topic everyone who makes a practice of sinning practice habit dwelling also practices lawlessness sin is lawlessness You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him, in Christ, there is no sin. No one who abides in Christ, no one who abides in him, keeps on sinning, and no one who keeps on sinning has either known him, seen him, or known him. So, if you sit here tonight and claim to have come to Christ but your life and your relationship with sin has not changed. Hudson doesn't. The Apostle John says you're a liar and you are not in Christ. And I say that with a finger 
same finger pointing at me. If I am not engaged in the battle against sin, I am not in Christ. The Bible says it. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born, born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this is it, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Wow. I feel bad. I feel bad having to preach that. I feel bad having to read it. I feel bad having to listen to it. Because that makes me feel guilty. Because I know I have not overcome sin. I have not reached sinless perfection. Charles Spurgeon said, I believe the holier a man becomes, the more he mourns over the unholiness which remains in him. The more sin you battle and overcome and do away with in your life, the more the sin that is left will bother you because you know it bothers you our Savior. And when we, we talk about sin and overcoming sin, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, don't worry because you can just sit back and relax. Jesus has taken care of it all. I can now tell who's reading their Bible and following along and who's not. Your Bible says anything close to that, burn it. It's not what it says. It says... In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You say, well, Hudson, that, that's kind of uh, extreme, don't you think? Well, you know, John hung out with Jesus. Um, and Jesus said... In Matthew 5, 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. And the, the Sermon on the Mount we could get really distracted about. But what, what I just want to say is look and think about what the Scripture says our attitude should be against our fight against sin. It's not something we should enter into lightly. It is not something we take lightly. The writer of Hebrews continues in verse 5, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. 
For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. How do we know? God corrects us. We feel bad because we're being corrected. That's okay. It's also a sign that we are sons. If God doesn't correct us, then we're not being treated as sons. And that's a problem. You know, we've had earthly fathers. You know, they discipline us for our good that we may share Verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short term, short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for holiness. See Verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. It's important that we are changed through salvation in Christ, that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, pray tonight and we we prayed Romans 8 28 we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to the, his purpose it doesn't say all things are good he says all things work for good and verse 29 tells us what it is that we may be conformed to the image of his son all things work together to conform us believers to the image of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is known by his righteousness. Therefore, all things should be conforming us to walk in righteousness. Going back to, to Romans 6, and, and we talked about the fact that the grace of God changes us. It changes our relationship with each other. Because we have to have love one for another. You know, John says that. You know, if you don't love your brother, you're not in Christ. You know, and, and that works for your brothers and sisters at church. If you're in a marriage relationship with a Christian, that means in your relationship with each other. You love each other and demonstrate the love of Christ to each other in how you respect one another, in how you honor one another, in, in how you are humble toward one another. Christianity teaches that husband and wife Submit to one another in Christ, in humility. Your house is not, I'm the man and I said and that's how it goes. That's not a Christian household. That's not a biblical household. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. We need to get rid of the sinfulness in our relationships with one another and treat each other with honor and respect as those who have been humbled by the Lord. Verse 16 to 18 back in Romans 6 says, 
Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now, the language here offends us. Slavery offends us. Now, slavery was very common in this um, point in time, and it was not the chattel slavery of, uh, of the early United States, but it was an economic slavery where people would, would indenture themselves to people who had money to, to provide themselves a living. But Paul uses this image to show that you have two options. You know, when it comes to Christianity, Jesus is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You know, and Jesus can say that because he's God. God come to show us the Father. Jesus is God, is the only way. And it's not exclusive as long as it's true. And it is true. The Bible says it's true, and, and we believe it. As such, we either continue to pursue sin, we continue to go after sin, in which case we are slaves of sin. And our goal is to be more sinful. If we're not fighting against sin, then, then we're given in, and that's the direction we're going. Whereas... If we give ourselves to Christ, we are slaves of righteousness. We are pursuing righteousness. We are on the road with righteousness as our goal. Uh, I'll quote again, I'll share the quote again from John Owen that we shared last week. Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Sin, the devil, are out to destroy us, to kill us, to, to take us away from the path that God has for us. Jesus provides his righteousness to us. He imputes his righteousness to us, and he asks us to walk in that righteousness not in our own power not in our own strength and i'm not saying you know you get saved and you can just start flip a switch and automatically be perfect like i said i don't believe in sinless perfection on this earth but we learn to submit to the holy spirit we learn to give ourselves to him and he gives us the power to overcome sin and the more we do that, the more when we fall, when we fall flat on our face, the Holy Spirit picks us up. We feel bad because we know we've disappointed the Lord and we continue on that journey toward righteousness. Make no mistake, there is a clear difference in the road and the destination between believer and unbeliever. So there is a difference in life and the way we live, as well as the destination. It's not like, become a believer, nothing changes, you just get to go to heaven. You know, don't be a, don't be a believer, you know, live the same way, and, and you get to go to hell. The road looks the same the entire way. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. Matthew 7 says, Matthew 7, verse, uh, thir to 14, uh, verses 13 and 14, I have to slow down or my tongue keeps tripping. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard 
that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Do you hear that? It's easy. It doesn't make any demands. Everything's just happy and cheerful and, and you know, it's not what the Bible promises the believer. The Bible promises comfort. The Bible promises peace. The Bible promises power. The Bible promises suffering. The Bible promises hardship. The Bible promises persecution. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus maybe will suffer persecution. No, it's in there. no baby in there. It says they will suffer persecution. And, and make no mistake, we have, a, we have a twisted definition of what persecution is. You know, um, persecution, you know, Paul was expecting believers to face life-threatening, you know, income-affecting, income living situation affecting, you know, physical danger, persecution. And we as believers need to get comfortable with that because it's what God has called us to. There's only two ways. The question comes, how do we tell the two ways apart? That's a good question. That's an important question. Matthew 25, Jesus is getting to this component where he is looking at providing a picture of the final judgment before the Father. And he tells this, starting at verse 31 of Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd sh separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angel, angels, for I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Throughout much of history, the church was known for its love and care of the poor, the infirm, the sick. Hospitals were started by the church. food banks, all, all, all these things. And, and, and this is where I come back to remember what I said about the gospel. The gospel is not giving food to the hungry so that I can be saved. 
gospel is not giving clothes to, to the naked so that I can be saved. It is not helping the sick so that I can be saved. That's doing works to be saved. But if I understand my sinfulness and the grace of God that has ch changed my life through the forgiveness of my sins, when I see those people, I cannot act without compassion or without mercy. And unfortunately in the church, and this is the American church, and this is probably a little bit of history you, you, you might live without, but one of the problems we have in the American church is in the sake of doctrinal purity, we, we have groups that have left the gospel behind to do social gospel things, feeding, feeding the poor, giving out clothes. And so the reaction of the Bible-believing churches has been to be, oh, we can't do that. People might confuse us with the people who have left the gospel behind. And so we're just not going to do any of that anymore, and we're just going to stick to the word. Well, you can't stick to the word and not do those things. You can't be a believer and not live out the love of the Savior that loved you. If you think you can live as a Christian, without sacrificing all that you have to demonstrate the love of Christ in the name of living out that righteousness, you just think you can sprinkle a little God on your life and everything will be good. Christianity is all or nothing. You either accept Jesus as Savior and Lord or you would reject him. If you just come to God and pray, Lord, just save me, and I'm not really going to change my life. I'm just saying this prayer, so you'll write my name in your book, and I'll get to heaven, and everything will be great. I don't have to change anything in my life. That is not the gospel. I grew up in a church, and, and you know, I was more important about getting your name on my list that you said the prayer, and after that, who cared? That's not the gospel. Jesus said, go into the, all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. You know, if we get people to the point of praying a prayer and we don't disciple them, we've missed out. And for all those of you not at discipleship class, we miss you. Not that you have to be in discipleship class to be a disciple. But man, the word of God, the time in the word... The fellowship of the word is important because we need each other. We need to grow in each other. We need each other to encourage us and to grow in the word. I can't do it myself. Christianity is not a solo sport. You know, it, it, it's a misnomer in America that Christianity, your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's a private thing. No, it's not. And this concept of independence, it's great for the country, it's great as a citizen, but as a citizen of heaven, I am servant to G King Jesus, and my life is committed to him and to his children that he has put me in family with, he has put me in relationship with. Because I am not going to become holier by myself. I need accountability. I need people to call me out. I need people to say, hey, Hudson, I haven't seen you in church. Where have you been? Or Hudson, you, know, that, you said that, and that was a lousy, you have a lousy attitude about that. Straighten up. I, I need that. Because I'm not perfect. I don't have it all. I don't know it all. You know, the men who get up here and share the word, none of us have arrived. We are on the journey with you. And we beg you to come, submit yourself to Jesus Christ, submit yourself to the gospel, trust in him, let him transform your life. And that part of that transformation is fighting against sin, fighting against that. Sin wants to deceive us, the devil wants to deceive us, he wants to get us 
you know, he wants to get us, you know, distracted by work. Oh, that's a really important project, you know. Just eight more weeks and, you know, don't see your family for eight more weeks and you'll get more money. You'll probably get a promotion. You'll probably get this. You know, your managers are experts at pulling your strings. You know, review time's coming around and I'm going to remember that you weren't, you weren't a team player. You weren't here, you know, 60 hours like everybody else. But God wants you to put your relationship with him first he wants you to put time in the word first he wants you to put your family first those things come before your job christian is not known by how high he climbs on the corporate ladder but how low he stoops to serve his or her family we are desperately in need of being transformed by the gospel every day Holiness, holiness is nothing but the implanting, writing, and living out the gospel in our souls. So how do we get to that point of being slaves to righteousness? We continue to take in the gospel. It's why we come back to it every time we're in the book of Romans. We talk about the gospel because it's the gospel that changes us. It's the gospel that gives us the power to overcome sin. The only defeated sin is a forgiven sin. And when we understand we have been forgiven, we are given the power to fight against sin. James chapter 2. Verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And there's an implied answer there. It's not written in there, but the implied answer is no. Faith that does not lead to good works is dead. And it can't save you. It's not saving faith. Verse 15, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled. You know, God take care of you. You know, I got a pantry full of food, but, you know, you, God will take care of you too. Uh, just, just go, get, get out, uh, leave me alone. If they say, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. When I was young, you know, they used to, people would preach sermons and, you know, we would talk about the doctrine of eternal security. And I firmly believe in eternal security. Once you are saved, truly saved, you are forever saved. But, you know, sometimes people think, you know, you need to be born again and again and again and again and again. That, you know, that's not what the Bible teaches. But, you know, people would get doubts. You know, you get saved at, at an age, you know, I got saved when I was eight. Uh, and then you get well, well, what did, you know, did I, did I mean it right? Did I say the words right? You know, was I sincere enough? Why? Because I think salvation is about me and my works. Because I think it's about how I prayed, you know, and, and not about the grace. But, you know, and, 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 and then, you know, preachers would say, you need to write it in front of your Bible. It's like a birth certificate. And, and so we, 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 we write the date that we made the decision. And that, then you can always go back and point to the devil. This, this is the day I got saved. How many of you carry around your birth certificate to prove you're alive? Yeah, kind, kind of what I thought. Well, then how do you prove you're alive? Look, hey, here I am. I'm alive. I can do things. Same way with Christians. They will know you are Christians by the love you demonstrate for one another. You will know you are Christians by your ability to do good works for the glory of God that come out of that salvation. People know we are Christians by the love and by the works that we do. Now, works is not the only thing because there are non-Christians who can do good works. So don't, don't confuse that. But there do could do good works to get points 
We do good works because we've been changed. And that is the secret of the gospel. Well, considering the time, I am not going to finish Romans 6 tonight. But that's okay because I think this is important. I would say, remember that the lost work to obtain a salvation that they could never earn. The saved, the redeemed, work to demonstrate the grace that they have received in the free gift of salvation that they could never repay. We're not trying to earn the grace of God. We're not trying to repay the grace of God. We are just demonstrating to others what we have received. And it is a marvelous thing in, in, in the grace of God that we have received. It is a marvelous thing. And we need to live it every day. Because we are no longer to be slaves of sin, but devoted to Christ and slaves of righteousness. Heavenly Father, Maybe, Lord, the slide projectors didn't work because we needed to hear some of the tangents tonight. Maybe I needed to hear them. And, Lord, I just pray that the time we have spent in your word will be magnified by the Holy Spirit in the days and the weeks ahead. Revive our hearts, Lord, with a love for you and a desire for holiness to be holy like you are holy because we just love you so much we want to be like you you have changed us you have transformed us and lord we are grateful for all that you have done all that you are doing and all that you will continue to do in the weeks and months ahead may you be glorified in it all for we ask it in jesus name amen now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a good evening.